happy Memorial Weekend. It's live from the VBF Facebook for May, which continues to be our month of awareness. Today, I'm here with our guest expert from Miami, Dr. Ana Duarte. Say hi, Dr. Duarte. Hey, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. She's coming live from Nicholas Children's Hospital and the Children's Skin Center, and I have the hat on for her skin Thank center. You. And uh, oh, hi, Mahela, she's on already. And um, um, also, Dr. Duarte is not only the director of the Children's Skin Center, but also the founder and director of the International Birthmark Institute. And we have a very great relationship with our colleagues in Miami. And we were supposed to have our conference with um, you last month in Miami and of course we're sorry that that didn't happen oh hold on a minute <laughs> a little craziness on the phone um, trying to see so I can see people are on and this is what happens usually they start we have seven people on so today everybody those of you that are joining Tatiana is on Sergey I see is on so he'll be watching um, Mihail is on we'll be taking your questions on um, during COVID, a lot of you are still home, unable to continue laser. You may have questions regarding um, your uh, propranolol treatment and what to do. So just go ahead and um, let's see, I'm looking to see, Alahi's on. Hi Alahi, I'm trying to see it on my cell phone so I can see the questions. Let me see if they are live on my phone. I'm not seeing it yet on my phone. Pop up as a live event. This usually happens for the first few seconds and then I can usually see it. Let's see. I, I have to wait until I see you and I <laughs> um, in the screen. There we are. All right. So here we go. We have four comments. Hi, Dr. Linda. And Duarte, Dylan here. Hi, Dylan. He's our social media guy. And um, so anyways, um, Dr. Duarte, we've been getting a lot of questions. And as they come in, I'll read them to you. We now have nine people on. Say hello, everybody that's on. And please let us see your questions. Um, so there's been a of well, of course, we'll want you to obviously address sunscreen. <laughs> and one of the things I said to a lot of the families is, since there's not much to do in March, April, and May, a lot of people have been going outside and they've been thinking about the COVID and, oh, at least I can go for a walk, but they were forgetting sunscreen even in March and April and May. Um, isn't that important? Like no matter what time of the year, if you have a port wine stain, you should be wearing the sunscreen. So sunscreen is really important for everyone, whether you have a birthmark or not, but especially if you have a birthmark, it's undergoing laser treatment. It's really important to keep your skin protected. And what is recommended by the Academy of Dermatology is an SPF factor of at least 30. However, if you're going to be out in the sun all day, in heavy, hard sun, I would recommend at least an SPF of 100. Studies have shown that it's actually beneficial. So 30 and up and reapplication every two hours, especially if you're in the water. You have to be sure the sunscreen is broad spectrum so that it covers UVA and UVB. And it's also important to be sure that it's water resistant. And all of this should be written right on the bottle so it's really easy to make sure your sunscreen is complete. Then you want to avoid the peak sun hours. Those are the hours between 10 and 2, so go out early or go out later. And then make sure you wear protective clothing, such as a broad brim hat, a long sleeve shirt, and seek shade. So sit under an umbrella, I'll find a tree, and um, then when you get out, get back in under the shade as soon as possible. I remember, and we have a couple questions, but I remember at one of our conferences in California, the baby had laser treatment with Dr. Nelson and the next day I saw the baby outside swimming in the pool and I was like, does that baby have sunscreen on? Well, it's really important, especially um, once you've had laser with the purpura, um, that you 
make sure you sun protect because you can then get some brown, some post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which you want to avoid because that's also going to interfere with the next laser treatment. So all that melanin that uh, develops in the skin as it tans can impede the penetration of the laser to the capillaries where it does its function. So it's really important to keep the skin as sun protected as possible before and after treatment and all through treatment with lasers. Very important information. Thank you. So we have some questions coming in. So um, the first one comes from Deborah Brubaker. She wanted to know, she has two parts. How long is it okay to pause pulse dye laser treatments for port wine? And then what sunscreen is best? I mean, I know you described the factors, but what about the pausing of the laser? So as far as the laser treatment, right now with quarantine and uh, stay-at-home orders, you have to do what you have to do, and you have to wait until your physician is able to uh, provide the laser treatments. For instance, now in Florida, we're open for laser treatment, but it was only this week that we got the okay to restart treatments. So it's okay. Um, the best treatment in the first year of life, as we, we've heard, is every two weeks, the best treatment interval. We're trying to abide by that gone by one campaign for port wine stains. But of course, if treatments are interrupted, then you just get in the next possible moment. You can't stress that too much because it is what it is. We're in unprecedented times right now. And, I, you know, we can catch up. Your baby, your child will catch up with the laser treatment. So um, it's not optimal, but, again, these times are not optimal. So I would not worry about that. You just call and make an appointment as soon as your physician can provide the treatment for you. Both Dr. Geronimus and Dr. Nelson have said if you miss one treatment, one makeup, if you miss two, two makeup, kind of like it's an even exchange. Do you think that? I agree. Yeah. I think you can catch up. Um, so, okay, I'm going to take a stab at this unless you can read it. Jenny says, también debe hacer en vivo en español muchos latinos tenemos hijos con malformación vascular. Y sería muy lido en español. Sí, bueno, nosotros, yo le puedo contestar su pregunta en español. Si quieren someter la pregunta en español, no hay problema. I just told her that um, I'd be happy to answer her question in Spanish. Okay, and so as um, anyone who needs to write to Dr. Duarte, Daniel, uh, Dylan is on, and he will post Dr. Duarte's email in the string here. Um, it's pdderm.doc at, doc at aol.com. You can get to her easily at that one. So Tatiana is asking, we stopped the treatment of my daughters before one year. Is it bad to have late, late laser treatment in July because of the sun? So we usually treat the year through. Um, as long as you're sun protecting, that's going to be up to you and your physician uh, when you get in to check, uh, see how the skin is. So some of my patients end up with a tan in spite of all efforts to sun avoid in the summer. And so I put off laser until the fall. But if they're able to sun protect and they're not tanning, I think it's okay to treat through summer. Thank you. Ariana says hello from Italy. Hi. <laughs> Um, Cambria Wallace said, I can't thank you enough for all you and VBF have done for our sweet grandson Banks. You are amazing. Thank you. You're very welcome. Deborah Brubaker is saying, due to COVID and hospital, not saying it's essential. My daughter has had her last treatment in February and she's having her next one in June. She's 3.5 years old. I mean, that's okay, right? We just have to do the best we can. Absolutely. Um, so she wants to know if you can do them back to back. We usually do them every other month, but could we do two months in a row to catch up? Like, is that even possible? Absolutely. In general, you can treat once the purpura resolves. So it could be a two week interval, it could be a monthly interval, absolutely six week interval, and catch up. Well, thank you for that. Hi, Vanessa. Um, Odessa is on and she said, will, may I ask if the port wine will disappear? I mean, maybe she wants to know on its own. I don't know. So in general, port wine stains do not go away on their own. 
with laser treatment, we can get significant clearing. Sometimes we can't get to 100%, but 80 to 100% clearing is possible. And treatment is thought to be lifelong at this point with maintenance treatment established once you get clearing or near clearing. Thank you. Um, so Sethi writes that her son's dermatologist says four weeks for recovery before the next treatment. And I know that's kind of controversial and there's a lot of dis, dis you know, some say two, three, four, some, some people in Europe, they can't even get treatments, but every three months. So like you just said, isn't it when the purpura clears up, you can just go for the next treatment, right? It's when the purpura clears up, and that's going to depend on the intensity of the treatment given. So when the pulse duration is very short, you're going to get a lot more bruising. It may take longer for that to clear, but that's a deeper, um, more effective treatment perhaps. So it's, it's patient-dependent, uh, and you have to discuss with your doctor to see um, when is the ideal time to go ahead and retreat. But there, So there's no given time. We estimate more or less every four weeks, every eight weeks, that's an estimate, but it can certainly be tailored to the individual patient. Thank you. Dr. Zax Khalil says hello from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Hi. Um, Carrie Beck Beckert is watching. Amanda Smith says my four-year-old son, my son is four months old, and we've been advised not to start treatment until after the pandemic. How determined will this, how detrimental will this delay be? We are unsure when we will be able to start. I think the earlier you start, the better. That's pretty much what is generally considered appropriate, starting treatment as early as possible. However, again, we're in unprecedented times, and so we have to adjust. And as soon as you can get the treatment started, that's going to be your best bet. And, and, you know, just to restate that, I've been doing this for going on 26 years and we've never dealt with anything like this. I'm ecstatic that Dr. Geronimus and Dr. Nelson have just started laser treatment. Dr. Levitin and Dr. Weiner are starting up. And what about yourself, Dr. Duarte? Yes, yeah, all this week we started lasers again. The governor listed the order and we were able to do elective procedures. And so, yes, here in Miami, we are performing all laser treatments again. Awesome. I'm so excited about that. Hello from the Philippines, from Odessa. Jenny says, okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm going to try this again with another one. Menino es aparado de malformación vascular. Todavía la falta una apresión. Mi pregunta es esto. ¿Le puede afectar su... I think it's a four month old. Conqueries muchas gracias. I'll just have her write to you. Yeah. So I don't know if you can see that from Jenny, Jorge Cabrera, past Odessa and Deborah. So, Jenny, mejor que usted me puede escribir directamente al email mío, que es pdgerndoc so um thank you <laughs> so our next one Sithi, Sithi has a great question and she wants to know because of dark skin tones and how does that affect laser treatment? Um, and that I think that's just a really critical in question because like we use what the Fitzpatrick scale, you know, and skin can range from pale white to dark, dark brown. Like, um, and so how does that, is that affected by laser treatment? So with the darker skin tones, as I mentioned, whether you get a tan uh, or you're naturally darker, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to penetrate through the melanin. But we as laser surgeons have ways to adjust the laser so that we can make the treatment effective and safe for you. Because what you don't want is to damage the skin as you try to clear the port wine stain. So this is something that may take a little bit longer uh, to treat patients with darker skin, but it is possible. 
and it's going to be up to the laser surgeon to look at the skin and look at the laser settings and adjust the parameters so you can have the most effective treatment. Great. Um, so Jackie says her six-year-old has a large port wine stain going into her eyebrow and hair and scalp. What kind of treatment can be done within hair and what can we expect as she gets older? She has had 30 treatments with Dr. G. <laughs> oh, well, you're in great hands. Dr. Geronimus is fantastic. In general, we don't treat in the scalp. Um, in the eyebrow, you can um, have a temporary, but temporary could be up to six months, diminution in hair. Um, and so, in general, we try to avoid the eyebrow as much as possible. Um, so treat the eyelid, absolutely, and the forehead, and then treat as closely to the brow as possible. The hair will come back, and if you wanted to, that area could be treated. But in general, we treat around the hair-bearing areas. Great. Um, so Mahila has a question, and I'm going to partially answer it and turn it over to you. So um, she's been following us around our I team, and her daughter's been getting laser with Dr. G, whichever country we're in. And um, I want her to know that both Dr. Um, Coletti in Milan and Dr. Tambris now in Athens, they both now have the V-beam and they do a discounted VBF rate, flat fee for laser treatments. And they're using the same settings as Dr. G. But she wants to know um, if in particular, if there's anyone in Europe in using the Prima laser but I know that Dr. Nelson and Dr. Geronimus are still working out some of the settings on that. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure who in Europe has the Prima at this point, to be honest with you. But we do have good contacts there. Um, and we can find out. Have, are you using it yet, Dr. Duarte? I, I am not yet. Okay. No. Um, so again, Deborah says, do you, oh, do you normally, she wants to know if you, if you treat the eyebrow. She said, I know it can cause hair loss, but Dr. Nelson said we could try Rogaine to grow it back. Yeah, the hair loss is not permanent. It's something temporary. But because it's such a cosmetically important unit on the face, the eyebrow, it's important um, just in terms of cosmesis. If you're willing to wait it out, it, it will grow back. It could take up to six months, and certainly the Rogaine can help expedite that regrowth. Great. Oh, great question here from Missy Moo. Missy says, why does propranolol seem to work better for some segmental hemangiomas than others? My daughter is 3.5 and hers is still very red. She was on propranolol from 10 days old until 14 months. Can facies be misdiagnosed whether the child has it or not? Can a child be rechecked? And at what age is best for lip reconstruction? So I guess she wants to know. That's a lot. She's three point. She's three point five. So. so she's three and a half years old. If the lean is still quite red, it'd be great if maybe you could submit some pictures. I'd be happy to answer them. I answer questions all the time on the for the BBF. Um, can faces maybe be misdiagnosed? Absolutely, it's quite rare, So, and, and we're always changing the criteria. I mean, new, new, new information is coming in all the time, so of course she can be reevaluated um, to see if she has any other findings to uh, categorize her as facies. Um, but certainly if the, if the hemangioma is still quite red, there's treatment that is available. Sometimes we've treated kids with hemangiol beyond age four, so there are those cases that need protracted treatment. Um, so certainly that can be reevaluated, and laser can also be used to help lighten the lesion. I, I really be it'd be really helpful to see pictures. So again, the PD Derm Doc at AOL.com is uh, an email you can use to submit pictures, and I'll be happy to get back to you. Um, hi to Buzz Rosenthal, my former boss and colleague. Uh, we're both members of the Capital District Jewish Holocaust Memorial. Um, uh, found committee, so we're working together on that. Hi, thank you for tuning in, Buzz. Um, Sithi wants to know: Will the port wine stain reappear during adolescence? So, even in cases where we get one hundred percent clearance at any age, within several years, these can come back. So it's going to be dependent on the patient. So yes, the answer is every port wine can come back, and certainly. 
certainly that's why these patients need to be followed long term and we just go ahead and restart treatment. At this point, we don't have a cure yet for port wine stains and there are some that will reoccur even three years later. Um, thank you. Um, Amanda said her son's port wine stain gets very dry in peels with small blisters. And I, I've seen that. Um, he was diagnosed with e eczema via a virtual appointment and prescribed a steroid cream. Is this eczema on port wine normal and will the steroid cream impact future laser treatment when we start up? Great question. I think, uh, yeah, it is a great question. And I, I think actually that Clearing the eczema will help the laser treatment because it's going to thin out the skin. So it's actually a good thing to make sure the skin is as normal as possible prior to a laser treatment. And we commonly see eczema associated with port wine stains, so that, that that's something that does happen. And as long as the steroid is a mild steroid, something like a hydrocortisone if you're if it's on the face, or a triamcinolone if it's on an extremity, um, those are safe topical steroids to use to help clear the eczema. Do we, do we know that? Like, why do we see this eczema on these port wine stains? Uh, I'm not sure of the etiology, but it is a described um, phenomenon. Yeah, because I had received a couple emails from patients who were post-laser treatment during COVID, and they were all, the, like, th several of them were getting this eczema, and I'm like, this is strange. Like, I don't know. I mean, who, I don't know if it's related well, I mean, to... During Disrupted, right. so they're all experiencing stress in, in one form or another, and it can manifest uh, as eczema, um, but just without any other changes uh, in terms of a person's stress level, it has been described, there's a syndrome uh, where it describes eczema in associated with port wine stains, capillary malformations, and so it's something that we have known about for, for decades. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Daylin, and um, we can't, Daylin, we can't see photos here, but you can send them to Dr. Duarte, or you could describe your birthmark, because Daylin is saying, I want to ask some questions about my physical appearance. Is there a chance that this birthmark I have will be vanished or gone? It's kind of weird, but here it is. So I guess it's safe to say, regardless, if he's an adult, whether it's a congenital nevus or a port wine, they don't go away on their own, correct? So, If it's pigmented, um, no. And if it's a port wine stain, it's not going to go away on its own. So either, either a congenital nevus or a pigmented lesion, is that what he's saying? Well, he didn't say what it is. He just said, my birthmark, will it go away? Will it be gone? And, you know, that, that brings up a lot of the questions from years ago when parents were told their child had a hemangioma when it was a port wine and it would go away and then they entered teen years and young adult years and they're like why do i still have this so i think that's I think, uh, yeah the diagnosis has to be established and then we can tell you you know what is the natural course without intervention what some of these do go away on their own um, but most of them do not. So I think it's really important to establish the correct diagnosis, and we'd be happy to take a look at a picture. Uh, pedidermdoc at AOL.com, P-E-D-I-D-E-R-M-D-O-C at AOL.com, or you can email the VBF uh, Foundation, and we they'll get the pictures over to me. And um, Dylan's been running your email through the string here so people can see it. Um, so uh, another question is, about adolescence again, like if if you clear up a port wine stain and it comes back in adolescence, will it be darker or mild? And I don't know how you can answer that, but. Yeah, there's no specific um, answer there. It's gonna be, it, it can be just about anything. If, it, if it's been treated early and it was completely gone, chances are it's gonna be a mild reoccurrence. I've never seen them come back with a, with a vengeance, so to speak. Um, and, and you just intervene and start laser treatment and just get back on it. Yeah, as a matter of fact, one of our board members sent me a picture of her daughter Meg's port wine stain, which is on her cheek, and she had a little white head on it. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I, and then I got comments like it could be a bug bite, it could be a, just a pimple, right. a little molluscum. But she was worried that it was a bleb, and I was like, nope, it's not a bleb. You have to worry about a bleb. 
And I think somebody recommend putting like just a little hydrocortisone or something on it. Um, so so one of the things though that I think we should talk about for a second because there's been a lot of questions about port wine stains in adolescence. And what can happen in adolescence is the overgrowth. We see that. And that's not something the laser is going to prevent. And that's something different than the question, at least the way we understood the question. So the overgrowth is something that occurs with, with the bone and sometimes the soft tissue. Uh, and that's something that we still don't have a good handle on. As a matter of fact, Dr. Coletti and Dr. Weiner are going to be doing a study on port wine stains with tissue overgrowth and how to correct them. But there are patients that have had 95% clearance with their superficial port wine and they came in and wondered why their lip was big. Exactly. And it's because the deeper part can't get reached by the laser and the deeper part has its pathology, it's programmed to, to enlarge, right? It's not going to just, right. you're, you're just taking the color away when you're, the laser is just removing this as much as it can of what it sees, but that has nothing to do with the deeper part, whether it's typically the enlarged lips are the ones that, you know, they want the most correction because it's the most cosmetic in appearance when you see that the lip enlarge and, and that's so something that we engage with plastic surgery uh, colleagues to do lip reductions and sometimes they'll even reduce the bone if the maxilla is overgrown and so there are a lot of good treatments for that that are not laser related yeah we actually have staff and board members that have had the lip debulking surgery and they look phenomenal um, so, um, Melanie is saying hi. Hi, Melanie. Jenny is, McGillis is watching. Hi. So, um, Dr. Duarte, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, why we're waiting for the next question about propranolol during COVID-19? So a lot of the mothers were writing about the babies were throwing up and are they more at risk? And, um, if they miss, um, if because the baby throws up, should they give them it again? Like, and if somebody in the house has COVID, is the baby on a beta blocker going to be at more risk? So several questions, very important. Um, one of the main risk factors for taking propranolol is hypoglycemia. That's lowering of the blood sugar. And so one of the ways that you mitigate against that is by giving it with a feeding. So one strict rule is no propranolol if the baby is not feeding well. If the baby is vomiting, the baby usually is not feeding well. So you need to hold the dose because the risk of hypoglycemia, which can result even in a seizure, let's say, um, is much greater if the baby is not taking a normal feeding. So you want to hold that dose and don't worry. Once the baby's feeding again, you get back on track. So that was one of the questions. So hold the feeding. If a baby takes the propranolol and spits it up, it's another rule of mine. I don't really know how much the baby absorbed before the baby spit it up, even if it's instant. Again, I've always played it safe. I tell the families to wait until the next dose. So hold the dose, don't give it again, and wait till the next dose. Again, no, no big deal if that happens. I think it's better to play it safe. Um, so that's two of the questions. Was there one more, I think, there? Um, yeah, it was, um, if somebody in the house has COVID and baby's taken propranolol, is there any risk? Yeah, no, I mean, this does not affect your immune system, the uh, propranolol. So there's risk, of course, of the COVID, possibly, right? But not, not because, right. they're not at any increased risk because of the propranolol. So Ledette has a question. She said, thank you, first of all, for being here and for your time. Can propranolol treatment cause long-term side effects and treatment usually starts at such a critical brain development stage? Any detailed research? So they're looking at that very closely. Now remember that propranolol has been on the market and in use in babies for decades through cardiology. They consider this to be a very, very safe drug. Um, so I don't think that there's going to be any long-term consequence. There has not been long-term consequence in all the cardiac literature, which we have at our disposal to date, but I know they're looking at this again now uh, it, with its use in, in dermatology. 
However, the doses that we're using are lower in general than the cardiac doses, so we're not expecting to find any long-term consequences. The issues are more short-term, and in general, it's a hypoglycemia, which can be mitigated upon feeding the baby. So the, the risk of bradycardia, lowering the heart rate, lowering the blood pressure, um, these are immediate effects, which are, again, very, very um, rare. I have not seen that as long as the medication is given correctly. Thank you. Um, so Jackie wants to know, and she said in particular, because you and I were talking about lip hypertrophy, are there parts of the face that get thicker with a port wine stain more than others, and is it the lip area? You know, it's not just the lip. This is a genetically defined, and so it could be the lip, it could be the cheek, it could be the eyebrow. You could have, you know, a hemi-hypertrophy of the face. It depends on the genetics of the particular port wine stain. They're all very different. Fortunately, the great majority are just superficial, and we can do a, make a huge impact with laser. There are these other malformations that are more associated with the overgrowth that, um, again, we have to engage with our surgical colleagues to help um, cosmetically improve those situations. Thank you. Um, so Jackie wants to know, who are the best candidates for propranolol? Well, we want to get propranolol started early. So we want to start at least at one month corrected age. So any baby with a mangioma, that is on, let's say, the face by a vital structure, the eye, the nose, the mouth. Um, if it's on the breast of a little girl, I mean, that is considered a vital structure. If it's obstructing the, um, the urethra or the anal area, all of those vital structures. So that is where you definitely want to get started early. But in general, anything on the face, uh, it's been shown that kids that aren't treated have a lot of self-esteem issues later on, um, become socially disengaged. So it's important to prevent the proliferation uh, by instituting treatment early. And that's one of the advantages mm -hmm. you have with a baby. You make the diagnosis correctly early. It's an infantile hemangioma, and you can get treatment started early. You can prevent the proliferation and then the need for plastic surgical reconstruction. Um, so um, I wanted to bring up a, a question, too, because we got a lot of this this week where a lot of the, the mothers were saying the babies on the generic were spitting up and having diarrhea, and they had heard that if they could switch to hemangiol, they would have less vomiting and less diarrhea, but then a lot of the insurance companies wouldn't approve the hemangiol, and, you know, VBF is out there on the forefront to push for that to push for them to have the option. Um, you know, it has, that's been clinically documented that the hemangiol has less adverse side effects than the generic? Well, the truth is, hemangiol is the FDA-approved drug. So we have a clinical trial, placebo, double-blind, uh, multi-center controlled trial for hemangiol. And so we know that it's safe and effective. And they did a lot of studies to get the taste just right for the babies. Um, so that's what I use. I have not had trouble, in general, getting my patients covered. So um, I guess this depends state by state. Um, but I personally prescribe the Mangiol. And I, I know there's a lot of physicians that prescribe the, the Propranolol. I don't think that it's any more dangerous in any way whatsoever in terms of side effects. I think you have to take the same exact precautions. However, I'm not so familiar with the taste issues with the propranolol. I mean, I think it's important to get the baby to take the medication. And so the taste factor is important. Maybe some of the spitting up has to do with the taste. Um, I would try to get the hemangiol. That's the way I practice. I use hemangiol for the most part. I have a few patients that are on propranolol. Um, because of insurance issue, but they are the minority. However, I don't worry that those patients are on propranolol are at any higher risk of any side effects. Okay, thank you. Um, so right now we're, um, let's see, we're, we don't have any questions right now. So um, also, so we could talk a little bit, 
you're talking about you were supposed to have your conference and we're supposed to have ours in September. Ours got moved to December in person and we're hoping that that will happen. Um, you know, we're going to be prepared for anything. But you were talking about um, possibly, you know, in the works to move yours to virtual. So will the families be able to participate in that as well? So yes, we're gonna we're, we're definitely gonna start filming, and we're going to offer the same um, talks. They're just gonna be virtual. We don't exactly know how we're gonna package this at this point, but we'll definitely let everybody know. It'll be all the speakers, so the morning sessions will be pretty much the same. Um, I just don't know the platform uh, how it's gonna become available. And then yes, of course we can have the clinics um, because that's not gonna be an issue with social distancing. And we'll have to plan that now, perhaps over the summer. Um, a lot of the people here that work in the video department, um, they're just coming in, coming back to work. And so there's a little bit of a backlog catching up. And um, definitely we'll let you know, Linda, though. Okay, thank you, because we'd like to promote that. I mean, we just did the largest international society for vascular anomalies meeting on zoom <laughs> and it was pretty interesting where they um did all the presentations and allowed questions so i think it was i think there's going to be some of this that's going to become part of norm where we will go back and thankfully our governor just said he sees value with children being in the classroom so he's pushing for us to have our children back in the classroom in the fall which i'm hoping will happen um so 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 several people asked for your um, email, so we're just posting that again. And uh, Tatiana um, Stefan, Stefanovaska wants to know, what is the best laser for Port Weinstein currently? So it's still the pulse dye laser. I have the BB Perfecta, which I think um, can definitely handle the great majority of Port Weinsteins in children. Um, Candela has come out now with the Prima um, a couple of years out, and I think that there's parameters there. It goes a little bit deeper. Um, the energies go a little bit higher along with that higher risk of blistering and, and possibly scarring, but in the hands of expert lasers, that is not an issue. Um, so please just make sure that um, whoever is managing the Prima understands it and understands how to um, manage the parameters. Uh, so I would say that the Vivi Perfecta and the Prima would be the best lasers for Port Wine States. Great. There are other companies which offer lasers. I happen to work with Candela, so I'm not saying that the other lasers are not great as well. I'm just not as familiar. Thank you. Um, so um, Dylan asks a great question. We have a couple of our adult um, males with port wine stains of the face that are on so I'm pretty sure they'd all be interested in this but he said he really doesn't like the smell of most of the sunscreens so he wants to know if there's one that's not so scented or doesn't have you know like the aggressive coconut smell banana smells he just wants a sunscreen that's gonna work but doesn't smell so bad yeah, I think if you stick to a physical block, um, that would eliminate a lot of the smell factors. So something like a zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. That's what I was thinking too. I know Dr. Nelson favors the zinc oxide. So, yeah. but but um, it's really pasty, right? But does it absorb into the skin okay? Um, they've got the micronized ones, which are a little bit cosmetically more uh, favorable. So. Yeah, so you can find those in the like generics drug stores and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. They're all over the counter. Okay, that's a great question, um, Dylan. Um, so Aaron wants to know: Have you noticed port wine stains become more red or darker after using the Prima? I don't know if you haven't seen it, but from all the patients that have been writing to me that have had Prima laser, I haven't heard of anyone saying it's come back darker. I don't know about you. I haven't heard anyone. It, it depends on the time frame. It may seem to be darker. I've had the same complaint with the BB Perfecta. 
If you have a very, very aggressive treatment, it may take longer to get back to baseline. But the laser does not create more blood vessels. It destroys blood vessels. So it doesn't trigger uh, an increase in the formation of blood vessels. So it, it, I'd have to see the pictures to see it, or, or even the patient to be able to tell you more definitively. Um, but it may just be that it's taking a little longer to heal. Well, and I think you bring up a good point, and this I know for a fact with several of the patients. Several had such amazing results at our conference in California where Dr. Nelson did the Prima laser and Dr. Coletti did the block on them. So he blocked it, and so Dr. Nelson was, you know, he did a pretty aggressive job. Well, they had such a good result that they perceived it was coming back darker, but what it was, what it had gotten so much lighter, when I asked them to send me their pictures before laser and I compared them, I said, it's still a little lighter. It's just that you had it so light compared to what it was. Correct. So I think looking at pictures will be really helpful. Yeah, I agree. Um, Amy Riley, she just joined. She said she's sorry she's late. She wants to know if you're seeing new patients. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Amy, her email is above. Uh, Dylan has posted it several times. You can see her email and email her directly. But you are seeing patients and you are treating with the laser right now and you're treating with the propranolol and also you're doing questions. And are you still doing telemed or are you just having them come in? Are you doing both? So we're doing so we're definitely able to accommodate virtual visits even so far across state lines so if somebody wanted to have a formal consultation we can offer that that's great um okay let me just see all righty so um while we're waiting for the let me just make sure i haven't missed any on here um okay Amy's yes. Yes, that's okay. That's fine, Amy. No problem. <laughs> She's just saying she joined late. You can also, everybody, go back and watch this video in its entirety. Um, you know, so the other thing is, Dr. Duarte, I've been getting questions from people on these IPL lasers. Do you have one of those or do you know about them? An IPL, IPL is um, not a laser, it's a light. Mm -hmm. Intense pulse light. Of course, all lasers are light, but lasers are specific wavelength, whereas IPL is a broad spectrum of light. So, no, I don't use IPL, um, but some doctors do use IPL to treat different vascular lesions. Um, there's a lot of different applications for the IPL. Um, and again, it depends on how familiar the physician is with that tool, and they may be getting excellent results with vascular lesions. I happen to use the BB Perfecta, and that's the tool that I feel that I'm comfortable with and I can um, get good results with. Okay, um, so Amy said that she's gonna, she would prefer before she drives to Florida to do like a consult with you. Absolutely. So she said she'll follow up. Jeff, hi Jeff, he's on our board. Jeff Bergen is on. Um, and another one is, the area on the upper lip and chin is stubborn. How do you get a good result? On the upper lip and chin? She says there, her area is stubborn. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of things you can do to tweak a laser. Uh, it all depends on the parameters. Some areas have more flow. And so it's going to be more difficult. They could be deeper. Um, it, you know, when you decrease the pulse duration, sometimes you can get more of a snap, and that can help. Um, I would speak to the doctor that um, is treating your child and or yourself, and then um, see how they can adjust the parameters. I mean, because there's always a way around it. Um, to, to make an adjustment so you get more of a reaction, a laser tissue reaction. We want to get a, a preferred response. So um, that's a conversation with your laser surgeon, like you need to have with your laser surgeon. So do you, do you if you see areas on a port wine that are more tougher, like deeper, 
do you adjust while you're lasering? Do you say, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you may do a treatment and then on the following treatment, you make a note, these areas, you know, I need to do something differently. Um, and so you can definitely adjust your ulceration within a treatment. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, you can change the spot size, you can make it bigger, you can make it smaller, um, so that you can change the depth of penetration. And of course, um, the Prima is made for those kind of situations where, you know, the, the Perfecta just can't get there. So again, though, in the hands of a qualified, um, experienced laser surgeon, because you can get to the point if you get too much blistering where you might end up with a scar, which is something we want to avoid. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I don't know whether I'm not seeing any more questions because I, I see a comment was pinned and sometimes when a comment's pinned, it blocks other questions from coming in. Oops, all right, I just want to make sure I didn't miss any. Um, so um, I saw, I just wanted to bring this up too because a patient sent me a photo there's Eucerin makes a hundred block. I mean, Neutrogena makes a hundred block. Is that actually possible? Yes, I believe so. I mean, I haven't tested it myself, but for them to put that on the labeling, the FDA had to approve that labeling. And so SPF of 100 is more than an SPF of 30. And there was always that debate whether that made any difference, but it has been shown through studies that it does make a difference when there's going to be a intense sun exposure so if you're going to be out on the boat all day or you're going to be out skiing all day in the snow um yes the spf of 100 will make a difference so it's important i think for day to day just you know sitting walking around the city or walking to your car you can use a 30 but um if you're going to have intense sun exposure 100 will make a difference that is that's awesome um so Melinda said, thank you for all the great information. She sent an email, including photos to you of her three months old son. She's hoping that you'll be able to help. She said it's a small port wine. And do you usually see good results on the cheek? Yeah, yeah, the central face is the most challenging area. Um, so, I mean, it depends on the cheek where it is exactly. And again, it depends on the size of the blood vessels, the amount of flow through them. Um, but once you start treatment, you should be able to get a good feel for how effective the laser is going to be. Um, during the ISFA meeting, I saw a presentation about one of the doctors from Europe was saying it didn't make a difference starting laser treatment early, but a lot of our doctors believe treating early. I mean, I've heard Dr. Nelson and Dr. Geronimus say, it doesn't matter what age you start, you can still get clearance, but do you still um, believe like we are promoting, you know, the earlier, the better you start the laser treatment, the better or the quicker you can get the clearance you're gonna get? I think it makes sense um, to start early. You're gonna have a smaller surface area to treat um, there's easier control of the baby, the smaller the baby is. As the baby gets older, the surface area expands, and it's also more difficult to manage the baby without having to go to general anesthesia. So a lot of these procedures we're talking about, we're talking about doing them in the office. So I think you can start early with, with the laser treatment for port points as, as early as two weeks of age. I, I just think it's, it makes sense. So um, one of the moms asked like about maintenance. She's like, if I've had three treatments on my child's port wine and I'm not seeing any clearance, should I stop treatment or could that be settings or is that when I should go to maintenance? I think that three treatments is very little. Um, I think you're looking at a minimum of six to seven just to get started. A lot of times these treatments will be quite long. I would not give up. I would reevaluate the settings um, at the meeting in December. I mean, that's still quite a ways away. Um, we would definitely take a look at that. Um, the settings are very important. If you're not getting a, a bruise um, with only three treatments, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I, usually, usually this treatment is quite effective. Um, so, I, I think what she was saying was, 
the last three treatments she had. She didn't say how many in total, but she said oh, okay. the last three laser treatments, she didn't see any additional improvement. So then I would say, again, the same answer, basically, um, you need to have the settings evaluated. And I don't know where in the treatment is, is this already like 80% cleared, 30% cleared? You know, where are you in the treatment? I would, I would need to have a little more information on that to, to answer that more precisely. But the first thing you would do is look at the settings. And, um, I also heard at the ISFA meeting, and I've heard this a little bit before, you know, we were always looking for possible Sturge Weber being right from the lower eye up. But now at this meeting, they were saying patients don't even have port wine stains on the eye or on the forehead. They can have them in other areas and still have Sturge Weber. So it's kind of hard to say to a parent, you know, when should you look for Sturge Weber? But I guess the majority of the parents' questions on when should we have an MRI and when should we be concerned, I guess we go with what Dr. Comey said is she prefers the imaging to be done at age one because she says before that it can be wonky, the imaging result. Correct. Age yeah. one is what's recommended unless there's seizure activity or suspicion of seizure activity earlier. And I think, yes, anything... And any port wine maybe is associated with Sturge Weber, but still you're looking at the V1, V2 uh, distribution as the, the standard that we still get most concerned about. And you, if it involves the upper eyelid, we want to be concerned about those. And then there's those few that don't read the book and they'll surprise us. But I think that we can still go with the more traditional thought for the great majority. Um, so um, with the um, sunscreen, one of the mothers also said if the baby's in the pool and playing and they come out, do they need to reapply it, the sunscreen? Yes, I would reapply if there's a lot of water exposure at least every two hours. And remember, it's not all just about the sunscreen. There's a lot of beautiful, really cute, protective clothing that you should get your kids very um, used to wearing and a hat and sunglasses. This is all behavior modification. It's really important to note that 80% of our sun damage occurs in childhood. Wow. So that is, that's something that's irreversible. So whatever happens in childhood, you carry throughout life. And in terms of your risk of skin cancer, which May is also the month of awareness for skin cancer. Wow. Just one blistering sunburn will double your risk of skin cancer. So it's really important to keep that sun protection and still those great sun protection behaviors of kids early on. And as a matter of fact, I was just talking to Dr. Mim, who you and I know is one of the leading world pathologists on melanoma, and uh, he said that they're seeing the largest rise in pediatric skin cancer in history. Wow. So, I mean, and he's doing a big study in Australia, and he said they are now making it mandatory that the children have to wear a hat to school in the, during the sun. So, and you mentioned about the clothing, the UV, are you talking about like the UV protective clothing? Correct, yes. Yeah, so like the children that have like port wine stains on the arms, especially maybe legs, that would be very important because they don't often get a lot of laser treatment either, correct? Well, absolutely, it's important to protect that skin from the sun, absolutely. So those long sleeve uh, swim shirts are fantastic. Um, okay, so then this is another one on which areas of the face are more, res more responsive to laser treatment. So the center part of the face is the one that's more resistant. So everything outside of that is gonna respond better. So the, the further out the port wine is from the center part of the face, like the center of the nose, the, the upper lip, the chin, everything outside of that is gonna be in general. And that's just what's been found. Um, no one knows exactly why that is, but that's what's described. Um, now this wasn't brought up, but you mentioned hemangiomas, you know, you do laser a lot of hemangiomas, right, that are early proliferating. And um, is does the same thing apply for them for the sunscreen? Like yes, that is, absolutely, yeah. yes. 
especially anything that you've lasered. So port wine or hemangioma. And I mean, generally you're saying you need the sunscreen, but especially following a laser treatment, you need to be really conscious when there's that purpura to keep it protected. Right, because you don't want the hyperpigmentation to, to persist. And that's a brownish color. So, and that will also impede the next laser treatment. So basically while my patients are under treatment, they have to sun protect religiously. What about the patients that have laser and they hypopigment, they end up with white patches? Yeah. So that's temporary, that will go away, um, but it's really important to sun protect that skin as well. So that will eventually fill back in? It does, correct. And a lot of times you get this particular pattern of hypopigmentation and then you see the laser, the, um, the, the areas the laser didn't hit, so you get like a net-like pattern. Um, where it's kind of white and, and then whatever color the port white is in various shades of red. And then the laser surgeon goes in and treats all the in-between areas and everything starts to normalize and uh, become more uniform. Thank you. So we are only have four minutes left, but um, I'd like you to ex tell us a little bit about, um, so what your new practice procedures under COVID so, you know, I noticed because I've been, um, had the honor of observing your laser clinics. Are you having, are the parents, you know, be wearing a mask? Are they being able to still be in with the child? Like, what are your procedures? So the main office is at the Nicholas Children's Hospital and the hospital is screening all patients for any symptoms of cold, of fever, and anything of that nature. and. Um, then the hospital itself is providing a mask for any adult that's accompanying the child. Um, in my office itself, we're doing the social distancing, all the disinfection, um, trying to keep the office completely decompressed by spacing everything out. Um, then in the laser room, of course, yes, we're still allowing the family in the room. Um, usually just one parent at this point to sit with the child. Um, you've seen how we do it. Where the a uh, parent helps us uh, position the child, and then with my assistant, we uh, get the laser treatment done. The family uh, member will wear a mask, as all of my staff is wearing masks and gloves and all the, the PPE that um, is recommended. And we usually do um, have the child wear a mask. Um, we can provide that, or the hospital sometimes provide it. I ask the parents to pick one up for the child. Um, and it's just under our supervision, just because children tend to cry a little bit during the laser, so it's just a little extra protection. Um, of course, if the port wine is right where, you know, the lip, there will be no mask on during that part. But if it's treating the arm or the leg, um, we'll have a little mask on the child while we perform the procedure. Of course, everybody wears protective eyewear for that. So um, it's pretty much, except for the PPE, the personal protective equipment, business as usual. Thank you. Um, one last question before we wrap up. So Amy Riley wants to know, will the hypopigmentation resolve on the lip vermilion? That's a tricky area. Um, I would have a question for her. Did it ever blister? If it did not ever blister, chances are the pigment will come back normally. I would love to see a picture so I can um, give you a better, more specific answer. So feel free to email me a picture. Um, the lip is an area that's very tricky because it's not your typical pigmentation like the rest of the skin. It's a little pinker. So we're actually depending on the normal pink color to restore uh, that, that lip vermilion. Um, so I would have to see that. I try to avoid the lip unless it's affected and then if it's affected, I tell the families that there could be a little lightening of that area and that can be a little more persistent, but again, that's going to vary patient to patient. Thank you. So um, thank you for a great session today. I look forward to actually being in Miami yes. when, when, when we can get back and get things going. I mean, every, everything is on pause, right? Like I say, 20, yes. 2020's been hijacked by COVID. Um, and we've repeatedly posted um, for all of you Dr. Duarte's email. You can see it um, throughout this um, entire question and answer session. And we 
thank you so much. And we look forward of, for all of you that will be coming to our conference on December 12th, uh, 2020 in New York City. Dr. Duarte will be there. We will, Dr. Geronimus will be doing free laser at his office the day before and there'll be free dental exams. So thank you all for participating. Thank you, Dr. Duarte. Stay safe. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay well. And remember, May is still Vascular Birth Marks Awareness Month. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you again, Dr. Duarte. Take care. Happy, happy Memorial Day. You too. Bye.